Hello friends. In this video, we shall talk about a common urological problem, which is pelvic fracture urethral destruction defect. This was the old name. Now this entity is known as pelvic fracture urethral injury (PFUI) and I want to talk to you about what are those factors which influence our surgical planning. As you are well aware that pelvic fracture urethral destruction defect or PFUI is a very common urological problem and it is often a challenging situation. In this situation, It is a known fact that more is the meticulousness in planning and execution better are the results. So obviously we need to concentrate on our planning part to get the best results. There are two points to ponder in this reference. First is when to operate, there will be a patient who will come to you with pelvic fracture destruction defect, maybe on a suprapubic catheter and you have to decide, should I operate him now or should I postpone his operation for some other date? This is the first decision that you will have to make. The second decision that you will have to make will be which surgical procedure to perform. So in the present video, I'll talk to you about this first point, when to operate and in subsequent videos, we'll talk about which operation to perform. So when to operate, which means the timing of the surgery that you're going to undertake for the patient, it depends upon four factors in general. The first is proper healing and stabilization of the bony injury. Second is proper local hematoma and inflammation resolution. Third is proper control of infection in the bladder lumen, adjoining tissues and urethra. And finally, there should be proper healing of genital soft tissue injuries which take place at the time of trauma. So I would like you to have your attention drawn on this word proper. Proper. What is the meaning of this word proper? And how do you say that proper has been achieved? So we will see these four points one by one. Firstly, proper healing and stabilization of bone injury. And for that, you have to assess the bone injury which the patient has sustained. This is done by a plain x-ray of the pelvis or can also be done by a 3D CT scan of the pelvis. The 3D CT scan is better but since it is expensive, uh, you can do lots of things still with a plain x-ray of the pelvis. So bony injury friends, you have to see first of all, what are the sites in the pelvis where the fracture has taken place? Is it either pubis, which means pubic symphysis or pubic rami? or ischial rami or all the rami have fractured. Having known the site, you have to know what is the degree of the fracture, which means how much is the displacement of the fractured ends and how well the callus has formed by now. And third point is 
कैन यू आइडेंटिफाई ए कॉम्प्लेक्सिटी इन द प्लेन एक्सरे फिल्म इन द पेशेंट वेर बाई आई मीन इज देर एसोसिएटेड सैक्रल इंजरी विच विल एड अप द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ न्यूरोजेनिक ब्लैडर डिसफंक्शन इन योर पेशेंट एंड विल इन्फ्लुएंस द बॉडी ट्रायल देर आफ्टर इज देर इंजरी टू फीमर बोन द फीमोरल हेड और ट्रोकेंटर और एस्टाबुलम और इज देर अ मेटल प्रोसेसिस विच एज इंपोर्टेंट बाई ऑर्थोपेडिक कोलीग टू मैनेज द फ्रैक्चर नाउ ऑल ऑफ यू नो दैट वेन पेल्विक फ्रैक्चर अकर्स ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ द मैकेनिज्म ऑफ ट्रॉमा यू गेट वेराइटी ऑफ फ्रैक्चर्स टाइप वन टाइप टू एंड टाइप थ्री आई एम नॉट इंटेंडिंग टू डेलीब्रेट हियर ऑन दीज पेल्विक फ्रैक्चर्स यू कैन हैव लेटर कंप्रेशन एंड यू कैन हैव वेराइटी ऑफ the the fractures the point i want to make here is with the help of these illustrations that seldom you have one fracture you will have one visible fracture and you may have two or more invisible injuries in that film so please be more accurate in looking at the film this is example of vertical shear for instance where you have fracture here fracture here fracture here and damage to the Ideal lumbar ligaments. First, focus on the pubic bone. Is there a lateral displacement, which means diastasis, or this diastasis, you know, has a potential for causing incontinence in the patient? Is there a craniocaudal displacement, or is there a inward displacement? Inward means. into the body inside the body and this inward displacement can be seen by the plain film or by the ct and you know that this kind of inward displacement of fracture ends can give rise to bladder injury or bladder neck injury so by looking at the pubic bone and by looking at the displacement of fracture ends and the bony fragments you can know a co associated underlying injury to urethra and urinary bladder system For instance, here is a plain film, and I told you to look at in the center first. I want you to have a scheme in your mind when you look at the plain film, and this scheme is if this is the whole film. First, I want you to concentrate on the center most part of the film, which is the pubic symphysis. right then i want you to expand your vision and look at cubic symphysis and ischial rami on either side by expanding your vision then i want you to look at innominate bone and acetabulum on either side and expand your vision and then finally i want you to look at at neck of a femur and trochanter of femur and the iliac crest the iliac crest and trochanter either side by finally expanding your vision so if you go in this manner from center to periphery in a systematic manner you will not miss these findings and let me explain to you this with the help of these excerpts so in this film you will see that there is a diastasis here and there is some injury here in this patient the degree of diastasis is more and you also have a cranial caudal displacement of the pubic bone and this will of course result in some injury on the contralateral sacral joint in this film you will notice that there is a callus formation here and there is a displacement of one end on this side in this film you will see a metal prosthesis now if you see metal prosthesis used to join these pubic bones obviously a transpubic uteroplasty is out of question until you remove this bony prosthesis so there is a whole lot that you will see for the pubic bone 
Let us now move outwards to the ischial bone, the ischial rami, and in the ischial rami, I want you to focus at the displacement. You can have either a lateral displacement, lateral displacement, or you can have a medial displacement of the bony ends. When you have a medial displacement, by medial I mean if you look at the patient in a lethargic position and you want to concentrate on the pelvic, the, the triangle, this triangle like that, one ischial ramus here, one ischial ramus here on that side, that's the angle, right? If a fracture at one end of ischium, the bone piece will move medially. If the bone piece moves medially, it's going to come on the way of your exposure. So this might compromise the axis. In addition to the displacement, major lateral of the ischial bone, also see what is the site of the fracture on the ischial bone. The most important point to see is, does it involve Alcox canal? The Alcox canal runs here, a little more in this direction, Alcox canal runs here. And in this canal, as you know from anatomy, runs the internal pudendal artery and the nerves. If you have fracture which is running across the Alcox canal or running close to the Alcox canal, what will happen? The pudendal artery will get thrombosed. And what are the consequences? If one side is thrombosed, the other side will take care. But unfortunately, if both sides are blocked by the fracture process, then the blood flow to the penis will be compromised. And you know that if you look at the blood flow of the penis, by one artery, the blood flows into the corporal bodies. And this is the urethral blood supply, spongious blood supply. The blood comes from the glance side also. And when we do urethroplasty in PF UDD patients, this is what happens. We detach urethra from this side, we mobilize urethra, lift it off from the corporal body, making what? This urethra now starts behaving as a flap. The blood supply is coming from the base, coming from the glance penis. So if the blood supply to the corporal body and glance penis is compromised, the retrograde blood flow to this end will be lesser and you will have ischemic necrosis of the urethra. What I am saying is, if the pudendal arterial blood flow is poor, is the result of the urethroplasty that you're going to do will be seriously compromised. So this is a very vital issue which you can know by looking at the, the film. And look at this plain film. There is a fracture here in the ischial bone. We are concentrating on the ischial bone now for a while. There is a fracture here, right? There is some displacement of the fracture ends which is coming in the way of the incision an exposure of urethra here but this fracture is very very medial same thing here but if you see another film of same situation you notice in this patient a butterfly kind of fracture and you see one fracture here one fracture here one fracture here one fracture there and you also see injury to the sacral bone the whole thing is tilted upwards. So when you have this kind of butterfly fracture, this fracture is fairly close to the Alcox canal. Look at this patient, either patient, and we are concentrating now on ischial rami. You notice one fracture here, this is very close to Alcox canal. One fracture here, another fracture close to a Cox canal. Some injury here also. And some fractures here and there. So in this patient or in the former patient, you should suspect that there will be problem with the pudendal article blood flow and you may do a pudendal angiogram before you do a urethroplasty. So we learned about pubic rami. We learned about ischial rami. And now 
we as i said go more peripheral in the film we want to know about other fractures which means acetabular injuries injury to neck of the femur or femoral shaft or trochanter the problem with these injuries are not that that they influence your urethroplasty procedure but they greatly influence the positioning of the patient which you going to make for the surgery look at this film look at this film and you will see some fractures here and there but if you look from center to periphery the moment you go to periphery you will see that there are so many injuries at other places apart from these injuries you see injury here and you also see lot of injury to the trochanter of this patient and some injury in the acetabulum as well in this patient you will see heel fractures here and there but you will see in the area of the acetabulum there is some opacity so the osteoarthritis has taken place in this joint because of which the patient position will be difficult so you can see all these things in plain film look at this patient and the plain film you see some fractures here and there but if you see more you apart from these fractures which i pointed out here and there in this bone you see a good metal prosthesis one point is jutting out maybe you don't know it's working well or not how mobile is the patient hip joint all these things are the questions in your mind so the key question now is how can you verify the adequacy of the bony healing before you start operating you have to verify that the bone has healed nicely you have a clinical test to know this and you also of course have a radiological way you have known about xa pelvis same thing can be seen by ct scan pelvis but what are this clinical way one clinical way is a gait test you ask the patient to walk towards you and the speed and the manner with which he walks will tell you about his hip joint mobility you can ask the patient to squat and the way patient squats you will know what is happening look at this patient moving towards you and look at this squat test hello you are the patient to sit hello if patient can sit like this it's fine this means he can be positioned nicely on the operation table in the exaggerated lithotomy position which you need for the urethroplasty coming to the second point so so much so about the word proper healing of the bone the pelvic bones the second point is proper local hematoma and inflammation resolution and how do you assess what has happened to the pelvic hematoma you can do complex investigations like mri to know what is happening to pelvic hematoma but uh, you can have some idea from the mcu here is the mcu of a patient and i want you to see the level of the bladder neck which is here it is very high this is his retrograde urethrogram and this is up there this is the level of bladder neck and you know the distance is so much when we waited for some time on spc and repeated as mcu the bladder neck has descended now so much down how has that happened that has happened because previously the bladder was sitting very high on top of the hematoma but now as hematoma has dissolved in due course of time bladder neck bladder has descended back on the pelvic floor also the third factor the proper healing of the genital soft tissue injuries and how do you assess the soft tissue healing look at this patient who has so much of soft tissue mutilating injuries here and there and it took lot of time for it to heal and even now that it has healed 
There's so much a star and graft. It is a nightmare for me to decide how to go, where to make incision, where to mobilize and do all that. So sometimes soft tissue injuries may be such that they influence your decision when to operate. The fourth factor, proper control of infection in bladder and urethra. How to assess about how much is the genital urinary infection? If you want to have an idea of what are the common sites where infection is present, the common sites of infection in these patients are one, in the early period, by which I mean less than four weeks from the injury, if the hematoma gets infected, you have infection at the site of urethral injury and hematoma, and this will result into local pain, fever, abscess formation, and sometimes the fistula formation. Fortunately, this does not happen in many patients. Most patients have infection in late period, which means after six weeks, when they have been on SPC for some time, either they have asymptomatic infection, which by which I mean bacteria urea in the suprabubic catheter sample, or if they have a symptomatic infection, it is either epidemiorchitis or in some patients pyelonephritis. For example, here is a patient who has a suprabubic catheter and a colostomy and he has two pus discharging fistulae here from where pus is constantly discharged and this is his MCU which is showing a communication and leakage here. Why these pus discharging fistula forms? And this is one thing in presence of which you cannot operate. So you have to know why these fistula form and you have to know what to do for them so that your main surgery can be done as soon as possible. The reason is that suprapubic catheter keeps getting blocked off and on or the patient is having bladder spasms and the bacteria is there because of which the infected urine is leaking here and there and causing abscess formation. So the key to the management of these fistulae are that you have culture specific antibiotics and you have a free drainage of the pus cavity. If the mouth gets blocked, then pus will accumulate and rupture elsewhere. So you have to ensure a free drainage by regular lavage of the abscess cavity uh, and use proper antibiotics and then change SPC more frequently and these fistula heal on it on their own. The second is bacteriuria in the suprapubic sample. And I want to first tell you why. Now this happens either because the patient has a suprapubic catheter and he has been carrying the same old catheter for a very long duration. In developing world, this is a very common problem. And some patients develop stone in the bladder. Why they develop stone in the bladder is, you see here this balloon of suprapubic catheter over which the encrustation occurs. And when the patient reaches the doctor for a change, he will deflate the balloon and take out the catheter. The moment the balloon is deflated, all the encrustations over the balloon are broken off and they are left behind in the bladder lumen. The patient now has a new foley through the tract, but these broken encrustations keep lying in the urinary bladder lumen and over a period of time they grow to become bladder stones. So obviously, if the patient has had SPC for a very long time and he has had many changes and he is draining turbid urine from the suprapubic catheter, he can have bacteriuria in the SPC sample. And how do you manage this? You manage this by frequent change of the catheter. You manage this by bladder lavage, by beta saline or whatever you can do, some solutions to wash the bladder and lavage the bladder. In patients who have developed these stones, you will have to perform what's called anti-grade cystotholopexy through the track. You go in the bladder, look at the bladder and wash all those fragments. Until you do that, the bacteriuria will not go. The second site of infection is recurrent epidemiorchitis and patients come with a painful scrotal swelling like that and fever. Why does it develop? This develops because of the reflux of infected urine 
see the patient has an SBC, he has a positive culture, he has a spasm in the bladder, the entire urine is pushed in the prostatic urethra and from ejaculatory duct the urine will go back into the epididymis or even there can be some situation of translymphatic spread here and epidemiorchitis is a very common problem in these patients. If you manage them with antibiotics alone or local incision to drain pus in the scrotal wall, you can sometimes have these pus sinuses going on for a very long time because the infection in the underlying epididymis is very severe, it has not healed as yet and patient will waste one and a half months in getting this problem solved. How to manage this? You have to manage of course the acute attack. But please remember if pus has formed, whatever has separated has to be taken out. The pus has to be taken out, the superating testis and epididymis may have also to be taken out in some patients. Therefore, because the price is too heavy for this, you should know how to prevent this. And prevention is the best way is keep bacterial load in bladder as low as possible. Do a frequent SPC change in every patient and you must try to find out from the clinical history is the patient having frequent bladder spasms. If patient has frequent bladder spasms, you keep the SPC pulled out because if you pull out the SPC, the tip of the catheter will not irritate trigone and spasms will not happen and you also give the patient various bladder relaxants. The point I am trying to make is focus your attention for a while on how can you treat bladder spasms better. So finally, when you want to operate these patients, how do you verify the absence of infection? There is a clinical way for it. If there is no pain and fever, if the urine is clear and on examination you find normal epididymis in testis, it's all fine. And this is what you have in most patients. But then there is a way to test you can do a urine analysis. It will show some RBCs and WBC. Don't worry about that. It will always be there because there is a suprapubic catheter. But when you do cultural sensitivity to say that there is catheter associated urinary infection, you have to have a virulent pathogen first of all and then the same organism must be growing in repeated cultures. One or two or three cultures and then only you should worry about this and treat this with antibiotics otherwise, otherwise low count bacteria, bacteriuria need not be treated. So friends, what decides the timing of the operation? This is all bony injuries must have healed. The hematoma must have completely resolved. There should be no symptomatic local or adjoining infection. And all adjoining soft tissues must have become healthy and well vascularized. And this usually happens three months post injury. That is why we ask you to wait in most patients with SPC in C2 for three months. But what I have told you here is what do you do in this waiting time period so that this period does not get prolonged unnecessarily. I hope you understood my point and will now be able to decide about this question very easily when to operate a case of palifactory uterine injury. Thank you very much. In case you have any question comments, you can post on my email or on my website.